a lot of people in this room, I'm sorry to say, are being absolutely fooled by people on social media. They're following the wrong people. They're following people who are trying to impress and are actually not following people who are truly impressive. Thanks for being here. I spoke a couple of years ago um, at Door to Door Con in just the room, right across the hall. Had a fantastic experience, and uh, I love what I do. I'm passionate about this stuff, and I really, really honestly enjoy speaking. Uh, for two reasons. Because speaking is really the only way that you can become immortal. Speaking, coaching, teaching, and being great at something. Because I'm gonna die, you're all gonna die. It's a sad truth, hard truth. But the reality is when you recognize that, you'll begin to want to become great more so that you can teach more. Because when you die, you can't speak for yourself. But other people can speak for you. Right? When you teach a great principle, when you coach something, people can share that forever. How many people can memorize or have memorized a quote from someone who's not even here on earth anymore? Right? They're immortal. Okay? The next way to become immortal is by being great at something. When you're fantastic at something, when you're a one percenter at something, when you're great at something, stories are to told about you. And that's another way to become immortal. So today, I'm gonna give you guys a very real blue blueprint on how to become immortal and how to become a one percenter in this industry. Okay, but let me talk about why I was given a microphone. 2018, uh, I, I won a Golden Door Award. It was my first year in sales. I did a thousand accounts in four months, three weeks, and six days. It was very difficult, uh, but I'm glad I did it because it put me on a pedestal to have this microphone. It put me on a pedestal to recruit better and build a company better, and we scaled the ranks of the top 100 quickly. And it's because stories can be told about those type of efforts. And that's why I have a microphone today. I think that's why Sam chose me to speak today. The next reason why is I have a really cool story. I leave the school, but I'm, I guess I'm biased. But my pre-pest control life, my pre-industry life, I played football. I played football at Brigham Young University. And then I played, yeah, there we go. That was one person. I played football at Brigham Young University. And I played a couple years in the NFL as well, and I got my dream there. It was a fantastic experience, and a lot of cool stories I have because of that. Um, like I said, I, I played for four different teams in the NFL, balanced around a lot, but I absolutely loved it. And so hopefully today I can give you guys, peel back the curtain just a little bit on how to become a one percenter. I genuinely believe there will be a couple people in here today that take all the things that I'm gonna talk about and really apply them to their life and to their mission here in this industry and become a one percenter. Because one percenters get paid, one percenters have the best <coughs> chance to become immortal because when they talk, people listen. They're great at something and they can live forever. Make that one of your missions, okay? But let's dive into some football. Who wants to do that? Just very quickly, yeah. let's talk about some football. Here we go, I see a lot of hands. That's probably why you came. So, like I said, I played football in the NFL. I was cut a few times. In NFL, they say, stands for not for long, not National Football League, because for some, it doesn't last forever. And I knew that. When I got cut for the second time, I'm getting fired up right now from these guys. When I got cut for the second time uh, for the NFL, at the time, I was like, you know what? Is this football thing going to go forever one more year? I had no idea. So I decided, decided to start a, uh, this business in this industry, Anthem Pest Control. It turns out that the NFL called me back. I was able to go back and play for the Minnesota Vikings. Went through a lot of life struggle. My mom passed away, went through a ton. And I came back to this business after the Minnesota Vikings cut me. And I sold for just a quick amount of time, but then the NFL called me back. And I was able to play for the Miami Dolphins. Now I have a video. Yes, they got it up. Now I want to, before we hit play on this thing, I want to share a quick story. So I was playing for the Minnesota Vikings at the time. This is four years ago. The purple team just cut me. So I was super anxious to perform really, really well against these guys. I was so convinced I was gonna score my first NFL touchdown that me and my teammate had decided, hey, if you score a touchdown, I'm gonna help you in your celebration. If I score a touchdown, you gotta help me in your celebration, okay? So I want you guys to watch and prove to you that I've always had this industry's back to a very high degree. And I love this industry, and so I had to put this industry on the map, I had to put my company on the map with my celebration in the end zone. Can we play that, Sherry? I'm up at the top of the screen. Hey, Paul, and, and, and so you look at the, the youth, that's, that, that's what makes you feel good. Now, now we just got a quick kick, missed tackle by, by Sam again. And 
another touchdown. But you 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 see you Mitch like Matthews, to see who spent time with the Vikings uh, within the last year. Guys that could come in and provide a solution for the next you know, next three, four, five years instead of just we went and hit the free agency market late last year due to injury. Three, four, who knew what I was doing in the end zone there? Just Talk to me. Give me the hand the free motion. Free market late. Last I was knocking on the door, baby. I was knocking on the door because I had a pest control business at the time. I was trying to put my people on the map, but also trying to give my team the absolute best. So we can get back to those slides there. Yeah, I'll take that clicker from you. Oh, my phone. Yeah, there you go. So, funny story with this. So, I was knocking on a door, obviously, right? The football was my iPad. I knocked on a door, had the proper 45 degree stance, had my iPad out, and of course I sold that thing on national TV. Complete laid out, knocked it out of the park, okay? But you, you saw me, thank you, there you go. But you saw me waving somebody over. That's where my teammate was supposed to come in. He was supposed to be my technician. But as I'm waving him over for the same day, I forgot he busted his ankle in the first quarter. And I, I remember thinking that moment, I'm not about to sell somebody an account on national TV and let this thing cancel on national TV as well. So I said, screw this, I'm gonna pump this backpack power sprayer and I'm gonna spray these pylons myself. I don't get denied on national TV. <laughs> so I walk off the sideline, Jay Cutler, uh, Jarvis Landry, uh, Kenny Stills were all there waiting for me, they gave me a big hug for my first touchdown. And they said, bro, what the hell was that? <laughs> so what do you mean? They said, you had the, you had, you had your first touch, you're supposed to do a cool dance, the Miami jig, do something. I said, I was the exterminator, baby. What else do you want from me? <laughs> it was a field day for the rest of the game with, amongst all the receivers, but I had to put my company on the map. Today, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna peel back the curtain on how to be a one percenter. And I have 10 different ways for you guys to be a one percenter. You don't have to write all these down and come in quote form, but the number 10 is my favorite number. I came up with something called the 10 of 10 liter challenge. The, the 10 is just the, what we use in America is how to judge things, right? We go to a restaurant, it's like, well, I was an 8 out of 10, 7 out of 10. The way we judge the opposite sex, you know, man, she's 10, right? That's what I said about my wife. The 10, the number 10, is a great way to really round out what we're going to talk about today. But how we're going to do that is going to be a little bit different than just running through some bullet points, okay? I want to give you guys a harsh truth as I kick this morning training off. The harsh truth is... Human beings, we are a very, very lazy species. You guys know that? We are predispositioned to be lazy. We're a lot like animals. Very, very lazy. We will do the absolute minimum, naturally, all the time. We'll do the least amount possible to accomplish a task. That's just who we are. We're much like animals in that case, right? For example, the last time you drove by a farm, were the cows doing crunches, pull-ups, and shadow boxing? Or were they just relaxing, vegging? The last time you went to a zoo, were, were the animals reenacting the Lion King? Or were they sitting on a rock, asleep, stealing your money? Right? We're just like them. Extremely, extremely lazy. Unless we're given accountability. We're put in a situ situation where we have to move. Where we have coaches, mentors, motivation, inspiration. The reason why I had 1% success in football is because I had no other choice but to be successful. If it was just up to me, I have no idea if I would have been successful. Actually, probably not. And I'll tell you why. Think of the last decade I had in football. I had a coach. Every single morning at 6 a.m., he is waiting for me. I can't even be a minute late or I shouldn't even show up. Not only can I not miss a day or a set, I can't miss a rep. The second that workout's over, there's a protein shake right in my face. Get over to your meal. Now, this many carbs, have this much fat, have this much protein. The second that's over, I'll be upstairs waiting for you. We got film to go over because you didn't have that good of a game last game. We got to get better. After that, we got practice. Then we got walkthrough. Then we got film again. That was, that was the last decade of my life. Not only with coaches, besides coaches, I had teammates who were competition who wanted my job. I had freshmen come in, four stars, five stars, JUCO transfers. So I had to perform because I had guys that wanted my starting position. Not only was I competing against my teammates, I was competing against other people from other teams and other universities for some futuristic job in the NFL. So I was pre-competing against people for a spot that I didn't even have yet. I wasn't even in that arena yet. Besides the, thank you, besides the coaches and the competition, we had the lights, we had the cameras, we had a million people per game watching, 70,000 people in the stands. I had no other choice but to perform really, really well. As a matter of fact, it wasn't because of me at all that I had any success in football. It was other people that brought out the success in me through coaching, through accountability, and through competition. 
only thing I did was I was extremely willing to let people bring out the beast in me. Because if it was just up to me, I would be on the couch chilling most of the time if I had none of that accountability, none of the coaching, and none of the competition. So remember that. If you can just know that and understand that we're very naturally lazy, and it takes a lot of other people in our corner, it takes a village to raise you, that's when you'll begin to understand that the only change you have to be success is to be willing to be accountable, to be coachable, and to be uh, put on the spotlight. That's the only chance that we have. Y'all with me on that? Do you guys follow me? Yes. Okay. So the way we're gonna go about this is I have 10 hats here. If you follow me on Instagram, I've started to wear hats with different quotes on them. I have extremely motivating friends, extremely motivating cool people in my life. And I have a bunch of people that I, I follow and love, and even people that have passed away. I started to wear their quotes on my forehead or something that I want to remind me that day. Why? Because when something's on your forehead, you just can't miss it. If it's it on your forehead, you're not gonna miss it. Right, when I'm washing my hands, and I look up and I see this quote, or I see something on my hat that I want to remind me to be successful, I get a split second to be reminded. When someone comes up to me and reads and asks what that means, I get the chance to explain it to them. Because right now, once football is done, I didn't have the coaching. I didn't have the, the, the protein shake right in my face. I didn't have a million people watching my every move. I didn't have, after a bad game, uh, uh, 50 different Twitter people on Twitter talking about what I could have done better. I don't have that. So I had to create an environment, just like I had in football, that was going to spit out a one percenter. And I had to create that now. So I want every aspect of my life, wherever I turn, I want the opportunity to become a one percenter. I want motivation everywhere around me. So there's no chance, no chance I can't be successful. I want more accountability. Bring it on. I want more coaching. I want more people watching. So I have no chance but to be successful. All I have to do is be willing. Okay? So I have 10 hats here today, and I need some participation because all these 10 hats will be given out. And these are my 10 of 10 ways to become a one percenter in this industry with three different topics, mindset, sales, and leadership. You match with those three things, you will be a one percenter in this industry. Y'all ready to rock and roll? Yeah, yeah. Let's make some noise. Y'all ready to rock and roll, baby? Let's go. You better pray I don't get up. I love this one right here. The issue is a lot of times enough people aren't watching us. A lot of times people don't even kick us when we're down. The practice is we have to practice kicking ourselves and grinding ourselves into the ground because a lot of times people aren't going to do it for us. What I mean by this is the only way for you to become a one percenter, I want you to practice this. This is called deliberate road blocking. Write that down or at least take mental note. Deliberate road blocking. Deliberate means you do it on purpose and with purpose. I want you to do this. Open up a calendar at a different time from now. Go six months in advance. Put your finger on it. And I want you to think for a second, six months in advance. What is something that only one person of the population has done or could do? Iron Man, hike Mount Everest, uh, do a marathon. What is something that one percent one of the people have only done? Put that on the calendar. Once it's on there and you stand up next to it, you say, this is actually impossible unless I prepare it. You walk back to the present day, to today, and you see something six months in advance. And it becomes impossible unless you prepare, unless you grind yourself into the ground and kick yourself while you're down. You have to practice kicking yourself while you're down so when it does happen to you on the doors every single day, you've already had that practice. When you do get to that six, day six months away, now you're looking at it eye level and it becomes possible. And you put yourself on purpose, deliberately, with the one percenters because you chose to put yourself there. Deliberate road blocking. Make sure you have something every six months at least that is extremely difficult for you to accomplish. And you can't. It's impossible unless you prepare. Number three. Who wants this guy? You want this one? You like this one? Okay, nice and loud for me. Here's the mic. I am the greatest. I said this even before I knew I was. Man, talk about someone who's immortal, right? Fantastic quote. Let me tell you guys a story. Let me peel back the curtain into my own life. My mom was a genius. She did things growing up that I had no idea were going to have the impact on me to this day. Maybe a lot of your moms do this, but when I was really young, five or six, seven or eight, a young kid, my mom, every time she introduced me, Hey, nice to meet you. This is also my son. His name is Mitch. He's really handsome. He's really, really smart. He's really cool. He's going to be so successful. And he's going to go play football in the NFL. Every dinner party, every baking party, every whatever party, at church, 
you always introduced me that way. It was so cringy and so embarrassing. Like, Mom, what are you, like, that, is so, that is so embarrassing for a little kid. Even into high school, excuse me, even until college, it was the exact same thing. What I didn't know that she was doing was she was writing my narrative. She was creating the story that I had to live. It was the exact story that I wanted, but she was creating the story that I could live because she instilled in me a belief that I was great well before I had even attempted to do anything great. The caveat here is we don't need anyone to do this for us. My mom passed away a few years ago. I tell myself those things in between my own ears all the time. I tell myself I'm great because I'm a one in a billion person and so are you. It's okay to tell yourself that you're great. If you open up a fairy tale, a book, the characters have to act based upon what the author is saying. The characters can't jump off the page. The characters can't go rogue. They have to do exactly what they're told based upon what the author says. You are that author. You have the chance to write your narrative and you give yourself no option but to be a one percenter by just writing your story. Tell yourself like a broken record that you are great because you're a one in a billion person. That is healthy. Give yourself that shot. You know, it wasn't until the peasant came by, saw the problem, and said, if I fix the problem, I can go home more easily now. 40 found was the value of gold right below it. This is the principle called the obstacle is the way. How many of us in this room live a life deliberately enough to where the obstacle is the most enticing? Oh, I love that there's a problem right there because I'm going to go fix it. Not many of us. That's typically where you find 1% success. That's the goal you're looking for, I promise you. Now, who's heard this before in this industry? Yeah, well, if my manager gave me a good area, then I would sell more. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, if he gave me a good area, if he moved that block for me, then I would sell so much better. Yeah, if my manager gave me, uh, you know, gave, me, gave me a sales script, I would sell so good. I would sell so good. Yeah, that, that's why I'm not selling a lot, because he doesn't train me enough. Who's heard that before? All heard that before, right? The issue is that mindset gives you no chance to be a one percenter. Before my thousand account year, we didn't have a script. I wrote one because I wanted one for myself. That's where the gold was at. My first summer, I never sold before. So I didn't know what good area was. So I turned every area into gold. Everything seemed to be the problem. The only chance I had was staring straight at a problem and knowing that something on the other side of that boulder was gonna benefit me. Start living your life in a way where you see boulders and they become the problem immediately and you fall in love with that. Number five, let's jump into some sales topics. The second principle of being a one percenter, especially in this industry, you gotta be a fantastic communicator and a fantastic salesperson. So I can't wait to talk about this. Who wants to read this? Yeah, I will, great. Okay, let's go here, we'll go with you next. Don't move. Hustle so hard, you no longer have to introduce yourself. It's a great quote. No idea who said it. If Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, walked in this room right now, would he have to introduce himself? No. no. Absolutely not. Kanye West? No. Donald Trump? No. Joe Biden? I had to say both. <laughs> <laughs> when we go to an area, when we go to area, do we get that treatment? Do people just know who we are? Oh man, you're, you're, uh, you're Miss Matthews. They have no idea who we are. When we go to an area, do we have a house built in that neighborhood or on the neighborhood group chat? We're not. People have no idea who we are. The difference between top performers in this industry and sales is they already act like people should know who they are. That's how confident they are. Think about an interview. If I'm an interviewee, that means I'm petitioning for a job. I walk in, I sit down, and I have to introduce myself and I'm a little bit nervous and I hope I can get the job. The other person is the interviewer. They call the shots. They're in charge. They're not nervous at all. They're supposed to be there. When we walk up to a door, who's heard this before and who is still doing this? Knock, knock, knock. Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Mitch with, with, uh, with Anthem or this solar company. Uh, I take care of a bunch of neighbors, just uh, Adam and Sam and David. They love my service. Um, I'm out here in the neighbor tomorrow and um, uh, who does your pest control? Who does your solar? Do you have solar? That was a terrible solar pitch, by the way. 
That's how probably most of you in this room are pitching. What seat are you sitting in? Interviewee or interviewer? Interviewee. You are hoping and you are praying that, that person is gonna tell you yes. You're putting yourself, and you didn't even know this, you're putting yourself in a position of inferiority. You're putting yourself in a position where you have to keep fingers crossed they like you. But instead, try this. You knock on a door, knock, knock, knock. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. You know why I'm out here, right? They're gonna say no. You know why I'm out here, right? No, no I, I don't. Did Sam, David, or Adam, did they not tell you I was coming by? They didn't. Okay, I'll have to get with them. They were supposed to tell you that I was out here. Now, are you in the neighborhood Facebook group chat, sir? You're not. Okay, no wonder you didn't know I was coming by. Now what seat am I in? Interviewer. Now I step on their porch, which is now my office. Am I still able to ask them if they have a pest control company or have they done solar before? Yes, I can still get there. Was that rude in any way? Absolutely not. But I've hustled too hard to have to go to every person and have to introduce myself and hope that they like me? If that's your mentality, there's no chance to be a 1% of this year. When you walk up to a door, you act like they should have already known who you were. Who's excited to try that out this year? Yeah. I promise you this works. The lips are starting to smack a little bit. Let me grab some water here. Okay, let's keep talking some sales. Let's keep rocking on this. Okay, be the passion that people don't often feel. My last word of work on speech, this is, oh, I'm sorry. You're waiting there right for me, man. Come here, let's do this again. I'm glad you stood up. Here you go. Nice and loud. Say it better than yeah. I did. Be the passion people don't often feel. There you go, man. Where that would pride, baby. Thank you. <laughs> There's two parts of the brain that we can talk to in communication. Okay? Let's talk about these. You'll probably remember this slide became my last word of work on speech. The neocortex, it sits right here in the front of your brain. It processes information, dates, facts, and numbers. But remember, it does not have the ability to make quick decisions. Think of the facts, dates, and times and things we're telling people all the time. It's talking the wrong part of the brain because that part of the brain can't make decisions. We're wasting a lot of time. The limbic brain, it sits right above your brainstem. It regulates emotion. It's known as your gut. Who here before has had something made up in their mind and they were for sure about it? It was a 100% it was surety. But their gut said, uh, I'm over here with this one, and you went this way with your gut. Everyone's had that before, right? Because your gut is more powerful than your brain is, your neocortex is. It will override everything. And if you can speak to this in sales, you will get people to buy from you when, they, when in their mind, it's a no, 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 for 10 different reasons, but they say, you know what? I like this guy. I'm gonna buy from him. My gut feels good right now. And that's how you get people to make decisions real quickly. So here are two ways to make sure you're talking to the right part of people's brains. In rapport building, a lot of people that we've sold to, they've heard it all before. I've been sold to a million times. People at the door have been sold to a million times. People who get sold to in general have been sold to a million times. Running through a list of rapport building questions, they're gonna give you one word answers because they don't know you yet. If you ask what, they're gonna, what they do for a living or what they like to do on the weekends, they'll give you one more answer because their gut hasn't registered that I like this guy yet. Why? Because they don't know you yet. For every question that you ask people, and this is great for conversation. You want to be a really infectious person, somebody with a great conversation. Every time you ask someone a question, hey man, where are you from? Are you from Washington? No way, I'm from Oregon. The Pacific Northwest is the best place on earth. Right away, his gut is a little bit more okay with me because I told him a fact all myself. No way, what do you do for work, man? I'm an accountant. I love that you're an accountant because I'm the worst numbers person on planet Earth. I'm glad there's people in the world like you. I've shared another fact about myself and I self-deprecated a little bit. So now he likes me even more and his gut is starting to move. I like this guy. And now he feels okay opening up to me just a little bit more so I don't have one word answers, responses from them as I'm trying to build rapport and connect with these people, okay? Share more facts about yourself. That's what real conversation is and be bold enough, remember, you the, you're the interviewer. You're in charge here. Start talking more about yourself, which is typically against what we hear. Get them to talk, get them to talk. Well, you will, as you begin to share more facts about yourself. Genuine compliments are absolutely massive in communication. 
there's a part of the brain called the striatum. The striatum, of course, is in the limbic brain. And it lights up. It flickers when you put probes on your brain. In the same manner, when you're given money as a compliment, the brain has no idea. It just, see, it just says, I like this. I like what I'm feeling. Compliments are literally money to the brain. But we give them in the wrong way. Our compliments too often, and our dialogue too often has a upward inflection at the end of the sentence. And it sounds so cheesy. Hey man, I love your car. Hey man, I love your house. Hey man, I love what you do for a living. Hey man, I love that car. Hey man, I love this house. It's more genuine. And again, you're beginning that, that limbic brain, that gut wheel spinning just through an introduction. So you introduce yourself the right way like you already should have been there. Now you're getting their gut really rolling. You can say anything you want and you have them eating out of the palm of your hand. Number seven, who wants to read this for me? I got you. There we go, nice and loud. It should be easy. Yeah. It should be easy, yell it out. I'm busy goal touching. I love that. <laughs> that, was, that was too monotone. Loud, but a little too monotone. I learned this here from Ed Milet. Who here likes Ed Milet? It's fantastic. He talks about a principle called goal touching. And I coined, it, I coined this term when people ask me what I'm doing often, I'll say, I'm busy goal touching, baby. What goal touching is, is experiencing what you will spend your money on after a goal has been hit, before you even attempt to hit the goal. That was a lot, let me say it again. What goal touching is, is experiencing, touching, feeling, the reward of hitting a goal or becoming a one percenter, you'll experience it well before you even attempted to go after the goal. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I wanna go live on the beach in California, and that's, that's what I'll do with the money that I make from this year's sales or from the business. The only way I have a chance to actually go buy that house in California for my wife on the beach is if annually I drive down to that very neighborhood where I want to live. And I don't have a dog, but I, if you do, walk your dog in the neighborhood and I wave at the neighbors as if I already live there. I go rent the car that I'm probably going to drive if I were to live in that neighborhood. I go eat at the restaurants that are in the local area so I can know what it feels like to already be one of them. I'll shop at the grocery store. I will already goal touch, live, and experience that goal well before I even attempted to hit the goal. Why? Let me give you an example. When I was like eight years old, I will never forget this. It's a random memory. But I asked my dad, I said, Dad, when you were a kid, did you miss not having a computer? He's like, how can you miss something that you didn't even know existed? When you actually have something and experience something, you've gone down and touched your goal, you've, you've, you wouldn't visit a lot which you'll buy a rental property yet, you wouldn't test driven a car annually that you wanna buy by hitting your goal. You've actually experienced that. Your brain thinks that you've experienced that. And if someone tries to take that away from you, AKA customers, saying no to you. You'll say, no, 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 no. I've already goal touched. I've experienced it. You can't take it away from me. Once you've experienced it, you already kind of have it. That's a lot different than putting something on a dream board and pinning it up and leaving it in your closet and having no idea where it is or putting it on your Pinterest board. That's a great first step. But once you experience it annually, it becomes too real to let customers tell you no and not let you hit your goal this summer. Who's ready to try this out? Okay, number eight, last three on leadership. Super, super critical. Who wants to read this for me? First hand, I saw this one, sorry, here. There you go. I'll give you both these, number three. Impressing people is utterly different from being truly impressive. Let me some Ryan Holiday, who else does? Dude is fantastic, read his books. This quote was also in the obstacles away. We live in a world right now where flexology, looking cool, has so much value, but it absolutely should not. A lot of people in this room, I'm sorry to say, are being absolutely fooled by people on social media. They're following the wrong people. They're following people 
who are trying to impress and are actually not following people who are truly impressive. Being truly impressive is the only way to become a top one percenter. People will always sniff you out. If they have high EQ, they will sniff you out pretty early, but eventually you'll just fall flat on your face. All you're ever trying to do is impress people and not be truly impressive. E.T. talked about this last night. He said, you're wasting so much time, time trying to impress people that you're forgetting to work on yourself. Who heard that last night? I'm so glad that he said that. So when trying to be truly impressive and making sure that you're on the right track to being truly impressive, ask yourself these two questions. Am I following the right people? Do I have the right mentors? Am I following the right people on social media? Is everywhere I look truly impressive people or just a bunch of people trying to impress people? If you ask yourself that question just weekly, you will quickly be able to sniff out. Your EQ just went up because now your brain is looking for the right thing. The second question you need to ask yourself, and this one hurts sometimes, is would I follow me? Would I follow me? If you're too busy trying to impress people, you know deep down, oh, I'm kind of faking that one. That's kind of not real. When you're being truly impressive, you say, absolutely, I would follow me. I've asked myself that question before and said, oh my gosh, the last month I've been pissed poor. Absolutely not. But I'm so glad I asked myself that question because then for the next month, I did everything I could to be able to say, yes, I would follow me to that same question. Who am I following? And am I following the right people? And would I follow me? That will guarantee that you're on the right path to becoming a great leader. Number nine, we got two more. How are we doing on time, Sherry? We're good. Ten minutes. Right on. There we go, love that. Okay, last two caps. Here we go. I'm right back. We cannot hold a torch to light another's path without writing our own friends we Thank you, thank you. Let's talk about this industry and its difference from other industries. Okay, I'm gonna put a line right here. We live in a world where, for the most part, we lead 1099 people, and we are, in a lot of cases, 1099 people. The other type of person that you can lead is a W-2 person. For the most part, in this room, I'm guessing we're leading 1099 people. I'm one. Understand the difference there. When you're an independent contractor, or you're leading independent contractors, those people are their own boss. They don't have to come to correlation when you ask them. Technically, right? They do not have to knock all the hours technically. If they don't, are they gonna have much success? No. But technically they don't. A W-2 employee, let's say I'm a leader here at a tech job here in, in Silicon Slopes, and I lead a W-2 employee, they technically have to follow what I say. Because they don't, then they just get fired, and they lose their salary, right? The difference is just by knowing that little bit of information should change your mindset to what type of leader you should be. A type of leader that burns so brightly develops so much and so often and is so big and bright and burning hot that people don't have to follow you, but they don't care. They're, excuse me, they're 100% willing to follow you. They will drop following this leader, this leader, and that salary to come follow you. If you're stuck in the mindset that people have to follow you, or they just should, they just should follow me, you won't grow the team that you want to grow. Always remember, that it is up to you, your personal development, how bright you burn as a leader. Are you a candle? Are you a torch? Or are you a flamethrower? There's different levels of how bright you can burn. Your people need to see you every single week and say, gosh, man, like, he must have studied this last week because he's just different. Man, that guy must have done something to redefine hard just a little bit because he's just different. You're keeping your people on, your, on their toes by how much you personally develop, how bright you burn, that you're lighting up everyone's path, that people say, 
I looked the other way for a second, it was too dark, and I came right back to that leader because he burns so brightly all the time. We lead people that have to be willing to follow us. They do not have to. Just know you are in an incubator. You are in the absolute best place to be, to practice, excuse me, being a fantastic leader. Because all you have to do is burn so bright that people are willing to follow you. You're in the right place. Number 10. There we go. It's quick. Ten out of ten, right? Here we go. We waited for it. Company culture is religion, not a servant. Gary V. Thank you. So last but not least, religion, faith, spirit, that's all felt. We feel those things. It's hard to explain those things. Sermons we are heard. We hear them. They're touch points. If in your business, in your downline, in your network, as being a leader, if it only moves when you open your mouth, you don't have culture yet. If your business still moves when you're silent, your people feel what they already know you're going to say, and they move anyways. That is when you know you're on the path to having great company culture. There's a Russian anecdote about a ruinous, empathetic leader. So this, this, this Russian man had a dog that he loved very, very much. And this dog fell ill. There was a disease on his tail. And this Russian man knew that to save the dog's life, he had to cut off the dog's tail. Wipe it completely off. But instead of cutting the tail completely off, he cut off the dog's tail one inch at a time because he couldn't stand the dog losing his tail. Wrong thing to do. Caused the dog a ton more pain. A great leader in this industry, I believe, is one who can and has the guts to bring their people up to the highest peaks of confidence. You take them in and you give them more confidence than they've ever seen in their entire life. You also have the guts, the willingness to humble them a little bit. Show them that being a peasant is the right way to be sometimes in the grind, that the obstacle is the way. And through that range, that dynamic, of bringing people's confidence up, keeping it there, and then just teaching principles about what it's like to be in the dirt sometimes. Through that range, you can create people who are evangelists of what you're talking about and feel and become somebody completely different that a lot of times you don't even have to say something. And they already feel that you're right there for them. They already feel that, hey, if I mess up, he'll still give me a ton of confidence, but he'll let me know about it. He's not gonna cause me more pain. He's always telling me that I'm a beast. Always telling me that I'm a savage. He's willing to say the hard thing, but he's also willing to bring me right back up to peak confidence quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, a one percenter is the only way to become immortal. It's a fun one, it's a fun journey. Take what I've said today to heart. Hopefully you guys have learned a couple things. Woo woo if you have. There we go, like that. I appreciate that. But I hopefully I peeled back the curtain just a tad bit on being a one percenter in this industry. You guys have the playbook. It's been laid out here for you. I'm sure you have fantastic leaders. There are great speakers, great panelists. Make certain this year you start to taste its immortality by becoming a one percenter. Thanks for having me out today, guys. I appreciate it. I make time for questions if you... I'm not in charge, I'm asking you. You, you, do. you have like four minutes. Four minutes. You guys want some questions? Let's do it. Do you have any like podcasts or YouTube videos that you can get more of? You like speaking? Like, I just need to put out more content. That's on me. Follow me on Instagram. I do a little bit there, but I'll make sure to do more for you. Right there and there next. Uh, well, I did bring them in my car. I brought my two inches. I think Jesse and I are, are, are going to get a run in a little bit later. So I brought my shorts in my car, but I had to wear the long johns today. Um, at what point were you set on doing sales for your career? Uh, I, I was, I kind of fell into this industry a little bit, right? Football was kind of up in the air and I had people that approached me and wanted to start a business with me. And I knew that the fastest thing I could be great at was probably sales and communication, but I knew that on my path to being a leader, those things were prerequisites. So it, it felt good, and uh, I knew that there were necessary skills to be great. So I wanted to get in, get in early. 
uh, back left and we're right behind. What's that? You want me to repeat that a little bit? Yeah, no problem. So who else would want to hear me do that just real quick? Okay. When I walk up to a door now, I knock on the door. Hey, how's it going? I'm Mitch. You know why I'm out here, right? Massive, massive head nods, as if they should have already known, right? They'll probably say no, because they probably don't. Some people will say yes, and that's perfect. But they'll probably say no. Then I'll say, did Sam, Adam, or David, or whoever I've actually asked about this door? Because let me pause real quick. I ask every single person that I talk to on the doors for a referral. They just told me no, harshly, kind of rude. Wait, real quick. Tell me which one of these neighbors is the coolest one out here. I make sure I get it out of everybody. And if they're nice, I'll get at least 10 names. To the point where they've told me about you like 10 times and I can't wait to get over to your house. I can't wait for you to get home from work. You know why I'm out here, right? They'll probably say no. Did Adam, David, or Sam not say I was coming by? And I'm a little bit shocked by that because they were supposed to. I asked them to. Okay, I'll have to go with them then because they were supposed to tell you that I was coming by. Now, are you in the neighborhood Facebook group chat out here? You're not. They'll probably say no again. Maybe they'll say their wife is. You're not. Okay, that's why you didn't hear that I was out here. 10 people have already signed up with me. Right away, I've established that I'm the interviewer. I'm on their porch, but it's whose office? It's my office. Anybody else? So someone who's okay, who's struggling with the discipline to become great. Yeah, it's like the morning routine, the discipline to take what you, what you, yeah. what you get. Any advice? It's great. Um, go, walk starts, dog, go walk your dog in that neighborhood. Hey, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I think, I think um, the more you really know and have touched what you really want in life, you really don't want to miss that because you've already experienced that, right? If you've goal touched before, so I challenge you that first. So it gives you this long-term vision, this longevity. Once you know that, you become more excited to wake up early. You become more excited to work out. Does waking up early still really suck? It does, okay? However, start small. Like I said, the only chance I had to be successful was a ton of forced accountability, man. I'll tell you guys this. I'm a nutritionist. I'm a personal strength coach. Even though I'm already really good at those things, I know what workouts to do, I did those for years. And I already know nutrition, my mom was a nutritionist, but I still have those things in my life, a strength coach and a nutritionist, because they're just a little bit better than me. My nutritionist told me the other day that the number one factor to whether or not you will hit a diet or nutrition goal is adherence. What adherence is, is every time you eat a food, you log it in my fitness pal, in this case. I log it so that he can see it. The fact that I'm eating the food, and I log it. So if I eat the food, my body's gonna react the same that if I eat the food, I don't log it. But mentally, it's different. So if I lo eat the food, log it, write it down so that they can see it, that's adherence. That's the number one factor to hitting a nutrition goal, scientifically, is just by logging it. Who says we can't take that and apply that into our own lives? Adherence, accountability. Doing something, logging it with your buddies to make sure that you hit all those weeks or going up on a calendar and checking it off. Because you do not want to miss those X's, right? That's adherence. Start applying adherence into all aspects of your life. Thank you guys, appreciate it.